This week's video was actually meant to be an entirely different video. It is currently spring, the season where birds begin to make nests and huskies begin to shed enough fur to make 538 fur coats. <coughs> so, I thought it would be a cool idea to put all of this fur into a basket for all the broody birds and film them harvesting this material with my trail cam. I had this camera up for an entire week and had over 400 separate videos to go through, but not a single bird was filmed even touching the fur. The only entertaining footage that was caught was one of my hens getting scared of passing crows. But with no further ado, let's get on with this actual video. Phasmids, especially Exatosoma tiaritum, are one of the easiest invertebrates to look after. But even though they are a beginner pet, sometimes things can still go wrong. But hopefully by the end of this video, you will learn all the common problems phasmid keepers may go through and the solution to stop them from happening. Similar to geckos and drop-tailed skinks, phasmids are able to purposely amputate their own limbs if they feel threatened. This self-defense strategy mostly occurs in young instars that are still getting used to being handled. Phasmids may also purposely drop their limbs if that specific leg has a severe injury or if they are finding it difficult to shed their skin. But do not lose sleep over a missing leg. Just like the geckos and skinks we mentioned earlier, phasmids also have the ability to regenerate missing limbs. That is, if they have any molts left. If a young phasmid loses a leg and then molts, a little knobbly thing that doesn't even really resemble a leg will replace the missing limb. After the next molt, the nubbly leg will resemble the leg of a first instant nymph. And if the individual has any further molts to accomplish, the leg will resemble a second insta leg, and so on. So, with that explained, if a level 6 female Xatosoma tiaritum loses a leg and then has her final molt, she will have a strong hand limb for the remainder of her life. And if she loses a leg after her final molt, she won't have anything regenerating from that coxa. To stop phasmids amputating their legs for self-defense, be sure to handle your stick insects correctly. If you need to pick up your stick insect, start by placing one hand in front of the stick insect, and use your other hand to gently push the insect from the back onto the hand at the front. Never pick up your stick insects from the top or with cupped hands, for these handling techniques make phasmids feel the most threatened and puts them at risk of dropping limbs. A very stressful time that you may experience is when your phasmid is stuck in its old exoskeleton and for whatever reason cannot get itself out. This usually only occurs if the environment is not humid enough. Mild cases may only cause a lost limb or two, but severe cases can leave the phasmid deformed, which reduces its chance of survival. If you believe your stick insect is stuck in its shedded exoskeleton, try misting the insect with water to soften the skin. If the exuvium has been stuck for quite a while, the new skin would have already dried, resulting in the exuvium to basically get glued onto the phasmid. Misting with water will help moisten the old skin for an easier removal. If your stick insect isn't having any more molting contractions, it may be too tired to continue trying to push out of the skin, so you will have to try removing as much of the old skin as possible. Once the stick insect is nicely lubricated with water, gently rub your fingers over the stuck shed to loosen it, but try not to pull at the limbs, as this may cause the stick insect to drop those legs that are being pulled. Eventually, the exuvium should start to peel off. To reduce the risk of your phasmid getting stuck in their exuvium, make sure they are in a humid environment and mist them with water whenever you expect them to be molting to ensure they are well hydrated. The most time consuming part of phasmid keeping is waiting for eggs to hatch. Parthenogenetic Exactosoma tiaritum eggs can take a whole year to hatch, and a lot of self fertilised eggs are not even viable to begin with. Sexually fertilised eggs, on the other hand, take around 6 months to hatch and have a higher viability rate compared to self-fertilised eggs. And even if the eggs are viable to begin with, a lot of things can happen during their incubation period that can kill the insect forming within, such as mould outbreaks, too much sun exposure, too much moisture, and even too little moisture. 
To give your eggs the highest chance of hatching, I suggest keeping them out of the sun on moist cocoa peat with a sprinkling of springtails. This incubation method reduces the chance of a mould outbreak and is a much more successful method than simply using moist paper toweling. If you want to learn how to sift out the viable eggs from the unviable, check out this video at the timestamp 359. The link will also be in the description. Once you have mastered hatching the phasmid eggs, you may witness a newly hatched nymph walking around with one or more legs stuck within the egg. This generally occurs if there isn't enough humidity within your stick insect enclosure. So you may need to mist the enclosure a bit more and perhaps provide a little more heat. To remove stuck eggs, you should be able to just gently grab the egg as the nymph is moving and they should be able to pull free. Majority of stick insect deaths occur during the first insta level. This usually occurs because the insect is not getting enough nutrients to survive for two main reasons. The first reason being that the nymphs are drinking too much water. First insta nymphs have a small stomach. If they drink water, sometimes they fill their little stomachs up with water and then don't have enough room to eat the leaves to gain nutrients. This eventually leaves the nymph malnourished, which can then lead to its death. Because of this, it is only recommended to mist first into nymphs when it is really hot, since they will get all the water they need from the leaves that they eat. The second reason that a first insta nymph may not get enough nutrients is because the leaves that you have provided them are too tough for the insect to chew through. If you have access to rose or bramble leaves, try providing these to first insta nymphs. These two types of leaves are very soft and are easy for their little mandibles to chew through. If you don't have access to rose or bramble, you can provide them with eucalyptus leaves that have the edges of the leaves cut to expose the tender insides. Sometimes your phasmid will be fine one day, and then you wake up the next day to find an abnormal gloop of hemolymph around the genital region, which can be a very frightening sight. This situation usually only occurs if the individual is a genandromorph and has genitalia that is both male and female at the same time. This mutation usually leaves fragile organs exposed, which get knocked around and injured as the phasmid moves around. When this hemolymph dries, it hardens and can be very difficult to remove. A large amount of dried hemolymph on the genital region can clog the orifices, which can lead to the phasmid egg bound and or severely constipated, which can lead to death. If your stick insect has dried hemolymph at the end of its abdomen that needs to be removed, Fill up a jar with warm water and gently soak the affected area until the dried blood is rehydrated and is easily removable. You may either remove the blood by gently rubbing the blood off with your fingers or by using a moist tissue or paper towel. You may sometimes admire your stick insects molting and think, wow, phasmids are really smart. They are so intelligent to know how to shed their own skin in order to grow bigger. But actually, Quite frankly, stick insects are pretty inarticulate, especially when it comes to spatial awareness. They may know how to molt, but they don't know how to determine whether a spot is a safe molting place to save their life. Because of this, your stick insects may begin to molt dangerously close to the ground, or even begin molting on the very ground itself. Both of these situations can leave your stick insect with permanent deformities when their new exoskeleton begins to dry. Severe physical deformities may even lead to death. To reduce the chance of your stick insects molting too close to the ground, make sure there aren't any dangerously low branches in their enclosure. And if you believe your stick insect is molting in a dangerous position, carefully move them to a safer position. And that marks the end of this video. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future content.